time. So I'm giving a brief as a DIA guy. He can tell I'm a former military guy. And uh, HR McMaster is listening to this too. And Joel Raber mm -hmm. bring me on their team. It's yeah. a small five-man team. And HR's job at the time is to find out the level of Iranian penetration in the Iraqi security forces. Mm -hmm. So I become their intel guy. Mm -hmm. And in that role, I get this uh, this advisory position inside of this, this nefarious organization stood up to basically be a shadow command and control uh, apparatus for what Tehran wants to do in Iraq. And it's <laughs> called the Office of the Commander-in-Chief. Is that what it's called? Yeah. Uh, so it was the uh, the OSINC was running battalion level ops. You become an advisor to that office. I'm basically an embedded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To, to get information. You're watching yeah, <laughs> closely. Yeah. Information. And, and the first time I I get in there is it's accidental. I'm in a t-shirt. I got a beard. Yeah. This guy comes up and says, "Hey, I got a meeting with uh, Dr. Bossum. and I hear you're the Dr. Bossum guy. So Dr. Bossum was uh, a female. Mm -hmm. His father was a rocket scientist. <laughs> So he was working with Saddam's, you know, ballistic missile, you know, nascent program. And uh, she's basically running execution ops. She's running, she's basically getting battalions to make people disappear. So at this time, every morning you'll wake up to 56 dead Sunni just piled up on a, on mm. a city block. And we're averaging about 56 uh, attacks in Baghdad a day. Wow. And... Uh, and we're hearing from our, our teams that are embedded with the Iraqi military that hey, these, these Humvees are rolling out at night and we have no idea what they're doing. So they're rolling out and conducting their own ops. Like an assassination squad. Assassination squad. I remember meeting with this one one Iraqi who- and Is this Quds? Quds, Quds these, these are militia, this yeah. is Badr, Badr Corps and, and Jaysh al okay, yeah, and Jam yeah, yeah. at the time. This is before Kitab Hezbollah, before AH, yeah, yeah, yeah. before the other groups. This is where Qasem Soleimani is picking the town. Welcome to the Border Wars Podcast. This is the number one podcast of the Americas, the only bilingual podcast that takes you beyond the border. Uh, I say this is the number one podcast not because of me, but because of our guest. And we have a very special guest today, Michael Pregent, who I'm gonna, we're going to go over all, your, all the stuff that you've done. You have like a long career, 30, 35 years in intelligence, in defense. You were served in the military. Uh, and you're like in the world of think tanks and experts, and you hear like in what they say in the swamp here in Washington, right, D.C. Right, right. So we'll talk about all that. But what I want to do is I want to take it to the beginning, because I think it's always interesting to me when we have uh, veterans on the show. I'm a veteran. You're a veteran. I think every person that made that decision to take that oath, to sign the contract and then to serve, whether it was 40 years ago, whether it was four years ago, always has like an interesting path to making that decision. So I want to take it to there, to beginning, because I, if, I, if I remember, if I hear right, you, you joined in 1986, right, in the U.S. Army? Right. So, like, right at the height of the Cold War, basically. Right. So, so, so were you, were you in uh, New York? Were you in Texas? Or I, were I was you? in El Paso, Texas. Okay, right on. So, take us to that time. So, what yeah, made sure. you join the military? Well, you know, this is, this is after Gaddafi, you know, was bombed in Tripoli by Reagan. This is after Grenada. So, I'm in high school, so I can't join the Army yet, but I'm starting to see how we're lining up against. You were aware, like uh, even in high school, that, about these big global events and things? Oh yeah, I mean, it, you know, it, was, it wasn't it was like a 24-7 a news cycle yeah. like it is now, right? So when something big happened, when we uh, bombed Tripoli, conducted yeah. airstrikes, yeah. everybody knew about that. Yeah. And then the Grenada, that was the, uh, the 82nd one. That's there. right, yeah. And uh, I was in high school, getting ready to join the military uh, because my dad said, hey, I'm not paying for college. So when you're 18, you're out. Yeah. And uh, so I, I joined the military. Uh, I what did, made you choose the Army? The Army was my last choice. Because okay. I'm from El Paso, Texas, and yeah. Fort Bliss is right there. So yeah. I went to the uh, Marine Corps. Okay, right. And the Marines said they wanted me to be a computer tech guy. I didn't really? Want, I didn't want to be a computer Why? tech guy. What kind of recruited did you have I, there? I wanted to be an intelligence, yeah. uh, in, in intelligence. And uh, I went to the Air Force. This is 86. So the Air mm. Force basically said, we're good. I walked in the recruiting office. I said, no, we're good. We're, we're good. Quota's full. Quota's full. 
I never even thought about the Navy because I just didn't like the, the uniforms and being from El Paso. <laughs> the uniforms make a difference. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the Cracker Jacks. Yeah. And being from El Paso, being landlocked, there was just no Navy community there. Yeah. I was born at West Point Military Academy. Okay. To two, okay. To two medics. Okay. So they weren't careerists. They basically served their time. Um, but you were familiar with the military culture and everything. I mean, you saw it. I was familiar with what I didn't like about it. Yeah. yeah. And that happens with what they yeah. call the military brats or what, you know, yeah. the people that they, they, they look at. The, the downsides of it. You know, because you know, every night in the news, you'd be a soldier from Fort Bliss that got in trouble. Because yeah. back then, Fort Bliss was a air, air defense uh, mm. hub. Oh. Now it's now it has, um, you know, strikers. Now it's an actual combat mm. uh, team. Anyway, so I joined the Army only after the Marine Corps got upset because they, the Marine recruiter said, uh, you know, nobody passes that D-Lab test, the Defense Language Aptitude Battery it's test. It's for Intel, yeah. And I said, well, I passed it. I got I got 105. So just so the audience knows, so the D-Lab, uh, Defense Language Aptitude uh, Battery, that is not a, it's, actually, it's not a um, test per se. It's like a, a, it's a battery, right? It's like, it's it's trying to assess your capabilities right. and your potential to learn languages. It doesn't really assess how you know a language. That's a different test. Right. And it's interesting because it's the funkiest test ever, right? It's a made-up language. Yeah. You know, it's, <laughs> it's a made-up like language big Latin to see whether they teach you, you can- Conjugate whether or not you can recognize. So, what'd you, know. you score? Do you remember? Oh, 105 at the time, which oh, wow. apparently was pretty. No, good. no, that's, yeah, yeah, that's Cat Four languages. So, it gave yeah. me a choice of Russian, Chinese, Arabic. I think the, the top three yeah, those yeah, were the Cat yeah. Five languages at the time. And I picked Russian. Okay, yeah, cool. It makes sense, yeah. And I got I got Arabic. Wow, which, destiny. Which yeah, fate. Yeah, so, <laughs> fate was so, calling. Yeah, it was good. So, I. Uh, did you I, go to Monterey? Yeah, I went to Monterey, California. How was that? That's like, that's the one thing I regret in the Marines. I never went to Monterey and I went to a DLI. So Monterey was great because uh, going there at 18, three things happened. So that was right after basic, you go straight. Right to, after basic, oh I got to language school, Monterey, California. So uh, the Marines kicked me out of the office because I said that I've already passed the D-Lab with the Army. I go to go to the Army. They give me a uh, <laughs> $10,000 bonus for learning the language, $25,000 for college. This is 86. So they're saying all the right things. And they're saying, you're going to learn Russian. You're going to be a spy. You're going to wear civilian clothes. You're going to be working in... Eastern Europe, and I get Arabic, and I get uh. sent to Fort Campbell, <laughs> Kentucky. <laughs> that's and, that's uh, the military right there, yeah, a little bait and switch. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, so I go to uh, Monterey, California. Three things happen to you. You get married, get divorced, to learn to play golf. <laughs> well, I wasn't married to get divorced. You're good golf? I didn't like golf. Okay. So I got married Okay. At 18 and got it an old eight months oh later. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Got, got with, with, a, with a Californian or something? Yeah, Cal yeah. California. Native, yeah. yeah. So California's got a really easy off ramp. Okay. So I got it an old at, at 18. So, oh, wow. How so, long were you ma like married or anything? Yeah, just just like a two, month? <laughs> two dumb 18 year olds okay. in Monterey, California learning Arabic. It's like one of those Vegas marriages. Love. Yeah. So when I was yeah. a company commander later on, when yeah. I had young soldiers, mm -hmm. I would tell them, whatever you do, don't get married. Like the whole world's <laughs> out there. Uh, the gods of love did not put your future spouse here at this small little base yeah. that you're in uh, what, in your classroom as well. How was so. Arabic classes back then? Because it wasn't like, you know, those were like the prominent languages that folks in Intel were learning. Yeah, so the attrition rate for Russian was 50%. Okay. They, they basically, uh, if you if you fell out of Russian, you'd go into Spanish or yeah. French, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right, the Romance languages. So yeah. the Russians w made these shirts, the Russian students made these shirts uh, that said, we learn Russian so you don't have to. Oh, <laughs> and then uh, we we had shirts made that we learn Arabic because you can't, <laughs> and then we had shirts made to make fun of the other guys that fell out, saying we're learning Spanish and French because we fell out of Russian and Arabic. <laughs> That's awesome, yeah. But anyway, yeah. It, it was it was a really uh, cool and was the Arabic classes big? Were there no, no, no. Say seven students wow. at day one. Wow. You have to learn to say uh, if you have to go to the restroom, you need to learn to say it in Arabic. Wow. So that was the first sentence I learned, you know. How to go to the bathroom. Okay. And hamam can be pigeon or bathroom if you don't say yeah. it the right way. So okay. my instructor, Salim Nimri from Jordan, would say, I'm not giving you permission to go to the pigeon. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. Salim Nimri from Jordan would say, I'm not giving you permission to go to the pigeon. And, <laughs> and he actually coined a, a, a nickname for me and he called me Solofat, which means turtle. Okay. Because I was slow. Okay. <laughs> but I was the first student in my class to come. But slow, like physically slow or like running slow or like no, no, mentally, no, just slow. mentally slow. Cause I, cause I was having a hard time yeah, learning Arabic, Arabic yeah. from Texas. And game. I didn't study. Yeah. I, I didn't study. I didn't study at all, but I was a, one of the first student, students that could put us together. And you're on the beach together. too, right? Like Monterey is right. Monterey, California, right beautiful. there in the bay. It's oh, beautiful. Oh, it's oh, a love boat of the military. It is. I've been, yes. I've been to DLI since, but when I went there, I was like, they offered me to go to DLI, but not in the beginning of the morning. They offered me later, like towards the end. And I turned it down because I wanted to go to college, but 
I mean, thinking to myself, I was like, man, did I make the right choice? Because yeah. that looked beautiful. It was great. So it was a year of modern standard Arabic, what they call Afusa, and then Egyptian dialect. Okay. And uh, so that's the one thing that I can still say, you know, Daras al Fusa, wa Lega Misriya, and the Egyptian dialect. Bathroom? No, no, no. no what is it? The Egyptian dialect. Is that what it's called? Lega Misriya. So okay. Misriya, Misr is, is Egypt. Anyway, those are the things you can say. So people are impressed with I think that. The only thing I can remember of Arabic in Iraq is Imchi. Imchi. That's the only thing get away from me. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. But um, yeah, it was, it was great. I mean, if a guy like me could, could learn Arabic, and, and of course it's it's broken, you know. Yeah. And, but my experience in the Middle East is most people, when they see somebody like me speaking Arabic, they bend over backwards to understand what you're trying to say because yeah. they know it's not your native language. Yeah. And they feel flattered that you took the time to learn such a difficult language, especially being a Westerner. For sure. So yeah. you, you served for um, 20 years, you say, but but basically uh, you go, let's say about 10 years before you get your degree, where you go to, you go to college. I'll go green to gold. So okay. green to gold Mustang. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You guys so you were enlisted. In, I was enlisted. Yeah. yeah. And then you went to an uh, officer, right? Yeah. Enlisted 86, uh, get commission, uh, go to green to gold 93, okay. get commissioned 95. So the Arabic language, uh, Program. So you doing Intel the whole time? Yeah. Oh, wow. So okay. I went to Desert Storm as a, oh. as a voice interceptor. Okay. And a, and a uh, signals intelligence analyst. Mm -hmm. And uh, I get back, and that's when I realize I'm getting ready to make E6, and I haven't been to college yet. Mm -hmm. And I'm, you know, 25 years old. Mm -hmm. Let's see, what, 92? I'm about 23, yeah. 23 years old. And, uh, I know that I want to go to college. Mm. And so I start looking at Indiana University, they have a good language program, mm. and then find that my Arabic credits from DLI. Yeah, they transfer, yeah. I, I went, entered college as a second semester junior. Wow, wow. Without without having- Well, I mean, honestly, college. the DLI training is, uh, I mean, that's a degree pretty much what you get over there. It's intensive, it's five I days a week. Three, yeah. yeah, three three courses at Shamanade University yeah. in Hawaii just to get my JPA up there mm. and then tagged up all the- uh, Military training and the, so the military let you like basically go to school full time or well, green to go program. So you get commission, right? So okay. commissioning program ROTC. So after desert storm, we were on stop loss, meaning oh, yeah. people with my skill couldn't get, out, yeah. couldn't get out of the military. And I wanted to go to law school. So I had no plans on staying in the military. I wanted to get out and go to law school. And so the only way to get out of the military was to go green to gold. Okay. Uh, and it's, That's it's, interesting. So you do it as like an offer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's an yeah. offer. So I, I was planning on getting out of the military. Okay. But, so I went green to gold. And, uh, you know, after two years of college, you get tired of eating ramen noodles and, you know, doing all the things <laughs> you do in college. So. And plus I, you were doing like really cool stuff in the military. You knew signals intelligence. You went there and you're like, no, like I'm stuck in the dorm. Like with Yeah. These I think one of the coolest things I did uh, is we were pretending we were listening to music while we were writing in these, um, these uh, vans in Kuwait city mm. during desert storm yeah. looking for advanced signals from the Republican guard. Yeah. So we're looking for specific signals. We paired up with these, uh, these uh, guys that I knew mm. that they were our former uh, military uh, experts at DLI, the defense language Institute that now had fake names, fake ranks. And they showed up and I say, Hey, Sergeant so-and-so. He goes, no, my name is this now. Mm. And uh, we'd drive around and, We'd find these locations and report them back. And we do that how during does, the daytime. Does, and we don't have to go into anything yeah. you can't, but how how do you detect a signal? Is it through technology or is there a human aspect to it? Well, through technology and then and then you, you basically listen. We're doing low-level voice intercept. Okay. So okay. LOVI team is, yeah. is what it was, but it was on on steroids, these guys had the best equipment. What we okay. were using to collect uh, was not a big base station radio. It was basically a handheld huh. radio where it looked like wow. a, a Walkman. Like back it then? Was, it was advanced. Okay. Yeah. So we, we did that and then at, uh, we did that during the day. And then at night we'd get on a guardrail, which was a collection platform, a little twin prop aircraft and fly below 10,000 feet because none of us had had the actual uh, training. Yeah. Uh, but they needed voice interceptors in the in the air, so we'd fly, and we basically would listen to uh, Republican guards talk about how much they missed their wives; they couldn't wait to get back, and then we'd you know we'd report on that. That's interesting. So like a lot of them probably didn't even want to be in that war, right? They're like like, like Saddam's like. No, not a, not after the, uh, the the defeat that they they were yeah. they were taken the, the the beating that they were taken, but the guy sitting next to me was an Iraqi-born uh, collector. 
Okay. And he- Working with us. Working with us. And he was the one, an Iraqi American, he was the one that actually intercepted Saddam preparing to use chemical weapons against the Shia and the South. I remember that, yeah. So that turned into a critic, which is a report that goes directly to the White House, directly to everybody else. And the guy sitting next to me, was the guy who did that. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow, wow. And we, we caught it through the chatter of Saddam or through one of the Republican Guard guys? Republican, Republican Guard guys talking about using uh, helicopters and chemical weapons. Wow. And that's, we had a no-fly zone, but we didn't stop that. the rotary wing aircraft. So they were conducting the chemical attacks with rotary wing aircraft. Oh, that's amazing. Are you, are you still in touch with this guy? Is this guy like recognized? Yeah, he actually uh, saw me on one of my interviews and then reached uh, out. So he sent me a picture of us back in that day. So I got this picture of, uh, of a 20... How old was I in 1990? So I'm 22. Yeah. He's there, and we're both That's right amazing. there outside of the aircraft. It was it was it's a it's a cool photo. So like like recently, too. I gave so you 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 t- you lectured or taught at uh, National Defense University. I think INSS, right? So you probably done a lot with also NISA, the Near East Strategic Affairs uh, Group, the Middle East. So they actually had me speak to a bunch of Iraqi military folks that came in every now and then. They come in for 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 courses, um, and. Like, I, you know, obviously I'm more of a Latin America guy. I don't do that too often, but every now and then I engage. My old translator from Iraq from 2003 was translating at that. I was like, blew my mind. I was like, hadn't been like 20 years. as I'm almost sitting and seeing him. Did you recognize each other right off the He track? recognized me. Uh-huh. He saw me on the agenda, so he knew right. I was coming and everything. Yeah. And he came, up, he came up to me. I didn't recognize him. He had longer hair and everything like that. But, you know, we're out in, in Iraq. But he recognized me. He came up to me. And, and it just like, it brought me back in a second. I said, oh, yeah. yeah. So, so that's cool. So, so anyway, so you go... You want to get out, uh, green to gold, uh, but uh, what brought you back in? Well, you know, I, I uh, you know, went to airborne school while I was in college. Uh, just, I was going to get an active duty commission and I wanted to be intel and I got intel. Okay. So I got military intelligence, uh, active duty, and I, I went in. Still with SIGIN or? or no, 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 no. All sorts of intel. intel. So I was yeah. a tactical intel guy after okay. that. So my, my units after getting commissioned were all infantry battalions. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. The Rakasans for two weeks. Then I went to No Slack, 2nd, 327th, uh, uh, you know, 101st Airborne Division. And then my captain time was spent the 82nd, 2505 Parachute Infantry Regiment. So what's interesting to me, and so I'm, and I have a little bit of this experience as well, but you, you much more because you were in during the Cold War all throughout the 90s, which, you know, for a lot of the general public, for the Amer- general American was like probably our only period of peace that we right. really saw. And, you know, not for military folks because they were out doing stuff, but then uh, 9-11 happens, right? And and boy, if you have a person that has studied Arabic and spoken Arabic and used Arabic in operational environments since 1986, I mean, boy, are you in demand now. So explain, describe that, you know, pre and post. And maybe if you want to talk anything about 9-11, that was a big moment for everyone. So Yeah, the thing about having a skill like that, speaking Arabic and being an intel officer, even when I was enlisted, um, right after Saddam invades uh, Kuwait on August 2nd, you know, 1990, the next day I'm on orders mm. to go to Vin Hill Farms, Virginia, to start working with these teams that are going to do low-level voice intercept. And you go as an individual augmentee, which, which I don't mm. like mm. necessarily because you don't, you don't go with anybody you know. Mm. You go and you fall in on somebody and you're always the red-headed stepchild, yeah. right? So after 9-11, same thing happens. I'm in the 82nd Airborne Division. Um, I'm not supposed to go because I'm the uh, the S-1. Mm. And, and the S-1 for your audience is I'm the admin, admin guy. Yeah. I'm the rear D commander. So if the whole battalion goes, I stay back to make sure the families are okay. Yeah, and the paychecks come. Yeah. And this is where I got in trouble because I wanted to go. Uh, mm. They needed somebody with an Arabic trailer. I had an Arabic trailer. After 9-11. But why, why are you an S-1 if you're an Intel guy? Because I'm getting ready to take command, oh, okay, so you got to have okay, the staff okay. job before you take command. Sure, I'd already done my S2 time with 2505 Parachute yeah. Infantry Regiment mm-hmm. for, for almost two years. Mm-hmm. And prior to 9-11, you know, our, our world was NTC, yeah. National Training Center, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, JRTC, which was down at Fort Polk, Louisiana, against a low-intensity conflict threat, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And then our big rock star event was a Sinai, a six-month tour, right, to go to Egypt. So 9-11 changes everything. Mm-hmm. So two guys ahead of me uh, didn't want to go because they wanted to go to jump school or a jump master school. Mm-hmm. I had a jump master slot. I was going to be a company commander after that, but I got, I wanted to go 9 11 to yeah. me, you want to do something. So uh, the, only, the way I got to go was by telling, so I was a single officer at the time mm-hmm. and my former battalion commander, Steve Grove mm-hmm. you know, from CENTCOM, yeah, the one yeah. that was, uh, you know, got in trouble, so to speak for, uh, 
making ISIS sound like the, yeah. the varsity team. Yeah. And uh, he would always come in every weekend and say, hey, so tell me about your weekend. What'd you do? So he'd like to live vicariously through me, my adventures as a single captain at Fort Bragg in, in Raleigh, North Carolina. And uh, I said, hey, sir, listen, you do not want me to stay back here with the wives. <laughs> and I'm joking, of course, you know, I'm not, yeah, I'm more know, dangerous in but, garrison. But it, it made my battalion commander laugh and made my S my okay. XO laugh. My three didn't like it. Cause I said, I, we didn't really get along. So okay. I'm, I'm, I'm an, I'm a one. He's, he's yeah. the three. And, uh, I said, the ops officer. I said, don't worry, sir, your, your wife's safe. <laughs> <laughs> and that got me, that got me deployed. Hey man, a little humor. I, yeah. I mean, Cause it, it, seriously, do you want, yeah. you don't want Anyway, I wanted to go, and, and, and these other officers ahead of me should have said yes, but they didn't go. Huh. And, and one of them never deployed during nine. Why? Why, why is that? It was just shock and anybody in the military. You, yeah. you can, you know, after nine yeah. eleven, especially five, six years after nine eleven, you should be able to look at good officers and see a combat patch. Yeah, yeah. you'd be able to look at good officers and NCOs and see that they've deployed. And I saw a lot of NCOs that avoided. That's especially in the intel, point. especially in the intel yeah. community, uh, in the army, you know, they didn't want to go out there. Remember state department when they said, we're not going to deploy, you yeah. just want to get us out there so we can die. Remember that whole thing right yeah. after nine 11, but you saw that in the officer corps, you saw avoidance. Huh. Some officers tried to hide it by, by, uh, wearing combat patches. And like, you know, what, where's that from? Oh, that's from desert storm. I said, okay, well that, this is nine 11, uh, 10 years after nine 11, Five years after 9-11, you have all these NCOs and officers from infantry units that have multiple deployments that have been experiencing PTSD, have been hit. All these things are happening. And then you have other officers that have avoided this. Yeah. And you, you can call them out. You can see it. That's a, no, that's a great point. I want to stick on that because... Yeah, the NCO in me never went away. So I always call that out. That, that's yeah. that's, that's, that's the, the, the E6 in you that you're like, you know, you're... And, and I think that's what, you know, we call them Mustangs in the Marine Corps. And that's why we always value the Mustangs because, you know, one of the things they teach our officers in the Marines is that you basically troop welfare. I mean, that's like you basically right, right. eat last, you, you go last, and you, you let make sure your troops are ready to go. And if you go to combat, you better be the first one yeah. uh, to go or else, you know, everyone else is going to look uh, twice or think twice. But I actually had a similar experience to that in Iraq, a uh, little different in the sense it wasn't so much on the deployment and orders. It's actually when we were already there. When we got to Kuwait, and remember we were in Kuwait for like two months because we're waiting for the right. order to cross the FIBA and everything. Right. And I, I remember it was March 19th or March 20th. It was around that time that, that they make, gave the order. But, you know, we were getting the the warning order and everything. Like, it's a thing we knew eventually it was coming. And as that happened and re reality started to set in, like, okay, this is for real. You're going you're going in Iraq now. Uh, I saw people freaking out. Yeah. And and, and I had people, I don't gonna, obviously I'm not going to say any who it was, but there was a Marine that uh, decided to not to go because his glass mask, his gas mask inserts, they didn't arrive. He's like, and he wears glasses and he's like, right. well, I didn't get my gas mask insert. I can't see it. And I was like, right. I was like, are you serious? I was like, that's, you're going to be a reason. And he didn't go. He didn't go. He stayed. And this was a, a guy that in garrison, in training, was like a hot shot. Right, like right, this guy right. was like, you know, top of that class, right. everything, all that stuff. And it, and it was different. There's, there's certain people that, that were cut from that cloth that said, you know, you know, this is what I'm signed up for. This is what I want to do. And then obviously 9-11, we're countries under attack. And they wanted to go, and then there was others that uh, did not. So, I, yeah, that's interesting you mentioned that because I think that was a less talked about phenomenon that happened. But it's also kind of part of that just general, you know, we we're in peacetime for so long, and there's, you know, you know, captains and majors and lieutenant colonels that they didn't see anything for right. you know, 15, 20 years. And now we're about to get into, you know, a combat scenario. In, in Desert Shield, there was storm, there was, but it, that, that was limited. And, 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 you know, there's Kosovo and the Balkans stuff, but nothing like what we're preparing for after right. Afghanistan and Iraq. So. So what's interesting is think about all those leaders that we cultivated after 9-11. Mm -hmm. Think about every American that joined the military after 9-11, mm -hmm. knowing they were going to go into harm's way, mm -hmm. especially regardless of service, because you could go as an individual mm -hmm. augmentee and you could go and, you know, a, a radio battalion or a, a signals a battalion would end up becoming a, a group on the ground responsible for patrolling an area or safeguarding something. But think about all those Americans that joined after 9-11. And, and let's go fast forward to the ISIS invasion. Mm. So ISIS invades Iraq in 2014 in June, right? Or Mosul. Mm. Mosul is the big tipping point for, for us to start focusing. So part of my experience jumping forward at the National Defense University was to go out and brief these units that were getting ready to go to Iraq and talk about what they were going to encounter. Mm. And think about 14. Think about all the knowledge that we had during 
the early stages of Afghanistan, the early stages of Iraq, going up to the surge, going up to when we left Iraq in 2011. And uh, you're in a room with the brigade combat team and the senior leadership in the 82nd. It's getting ready to go to, to Iraq to be the first guys on the ground to partner with the Iraqi army to go after ISIS. And you ask, how many of you guys have been to Iraq before? And the only people that raised their hands were the E7 oh, and majors listed. and above. Yeah. And none of the captains, lieutenants, and sergeants had any experience huh. in Iraq. And we had already lost that institutional knowledge in, in, in less than a generation. People got out. People yeah. got out. You know, you don't want, want to go to these wars when you don't see that your leadership in D.C. wants to win them. Yeah. You know, we finally got Iraq right during the surge, right? Yeah, 07, yeah. 08. And then we squandered that away. Yeah. Afghanistan, we never really got right. No, no. We were in Afghanistan 20 times for one year. It was year. spiraling for a long yeah. time. Yeah. We were in there 20 times for one year at a time with a different strategy each year. And the enemy just learns a playbook. And every year I felt like in Afghanistan was like a pitch for the next year. It was like, okay, yeah, we'll, yeah. we'll get it better next year. We'll get it better next year. And, yeah. and in what, what war do you give the enemy spring break? <laughs> yeah, you know, true, yeah. a winter vacation. Yeah. You know, it, it Afghanistan, we can talk about that later. I'm a veteran of both Afghanistan and the Iraq. Wars. But you went to Afghanistan first, right? Yes. Right, right after 9-11, right? Right after 9 That's the when you, when you were talking about, you raised your hand, you said, I want to go. Yeah. We're talking about Afghanistan. Yes. Were, were you, was that the operation? Was it uh, Anaconda? What was the operation that first came in? Where? Well, Anaconda was at CENTCOM briefing okay. uh, General uh, Kimmons and, and another general, I forget okay. his name. But uh, Kimmons was the J-2 and, uh, you know, General, was it Rich? Was the first the first guy? Anyway, briefing those guys on on Anaconda, okay, and basically talking about what Al Qaeda and the Taliban were doing. And uh, then I got asked, "Hey, do you want to go run a detention cell in uh, in Afghanistan at Bagram, okay, for, for CJ Sotov?" Okay, I said I said yes. All right. And so I got there, and as soon as I got off the plane, General Flynn walks up to me and says, hey, do you want to be a company commander while you're out here? We need a company commander for CJTF-180, Combined Joint Task Force 180. I said, yes, sir. You know, you're an intel officer. Yeah. Of course you want to be a company commander, especially in a combat zone. Uh, my brigade commander at the time when I was in the 101st comes up to me, or in the 82nd, uh, General Maffey okay. comes up to me. Colonel Maffey at the time says, you don't want this command. This is not a command. Mm. There's no MTO. There's nothing set up. It's basically command and name only. Yeah. And that's exactly what it was. But it did save me from being relieved of command because had I taken that uh, CJ Soto spot, yeah. um, that's when, I don't know if you remember, but early on there was a detainee death, a suffocation in a, in a sleeping bag. And the whole chain of command got relieved oh, wow. for that. But was it, was it, was it at fault of the folks that were They're doing the interrogations? You okay. Know, it was, right. you know, the guy, the guy, Freaked out in the sleeping bag, and they thought he could handle it, and he, he couldn't. Okay. Some people can't handle less stuff. Man. Yeah, I remember, that, and that there was that that was a period when did Abu Ghraib hit? I think that was like oh seven or eight or something. Yeah. Oh no, it was earlier. It was earlier. Yeah, it was earlier. Yeah, two thousand. Like I'm, I'm at Fort Huachuca when that hits, so that's oh four two thousand four or five. Yeah, oh four. Yeah. yeah, so Abu Ghraib kind of built this conversation oh. here in DC, and I was I was over, over, I was overseas, but I remember hearing about like you know the enhanced interrogation and all that stuff. It, it became like a, a policy talk. See, Abu G was a National Guard military police unit. Yeah. mimicking what they saw the experts do at night yeah, yeah, yeah. or in the daytime yeah. doing it at night without supervision. Yeah. And they, they took it too far. They were mimicking what the experts were doing and embellishing, yeah. making up stuff as they went. And that set back. Yeah. That was a black eye. That it set black back eye. everything. Yeah, I know. I remember I was, I was at a CI unit in, uh, uh, here, here in Washington and they, when when it when it hit the stories, hit the, like for one, they were doing everything wrong, right? Because they're not doing any of the like the you know the enhanced interrogation is not a, a single act, right? It's it's a process, an interrogation is general process, and they were showing like they were doing it almost uh, instantaneously uh, on detainees were just being uh, checked in or just being uh, put into the detention center. So yeah, it was a huge setback. But that 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 hurt you also when you went down to, uh, to Afghanistan. Well, I, w I was already back from Afghanistan, okay. so I went in Afghanistan. And I Let's see. July 28th, I have a parachute accident. September 11th happened. You had a parachute accident? Yeah, and then I deploy well, with a profile. What happened, what happened there? I, my, my, I got, I had a hole at about 40, okay. 40 feet. So I basically it lost jump? air. It was a static line. Static, yeah. Static line jump. Shifted my pelvis, tore ligaments in my abdomen Ooh. and my Did it, did it like tor torque you sideways or something? Yeah, I mean, I, I basically lost air at 40 feet. <sighs> oh, and, terminal uh, I was hospital yeah. for two weeks. 
And Were you able to pull the rip cord, or like the? No, my chute opened. It just started developing a hole. Okay. <laughs> so you know, my chute opened, but then it then it had a malfunction. Okay. And nine uh, eleven happened, and I I deployed on profile. I didn't tell anyone, and no one asked. Mm. And so I get to Afghanistan. Uh, so this is two thousand. I get to I get to Syncom first, uh, working as a foreign fighter, Al Qaeda, Taliban analyst. We're briefing uh, the senior leadership at four o'clock every morning, mm. and. Uh, so we saw success when I was in Afghanistan. It was an intelligence-driven uh, war. You develop the intel and you'd go after Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. And we'd, have, we'd stay on the fobs and we'd go hit. So there wasn't a big presence mm. because, I mean, it was interesting. We'd, we'd fly around in helicopters and you'd see things. And a lot of the Afghans that we were running into thought we were Russians. They had no idea the U.S. had invaded. Mm. I had a 30-man uh, uh, team of Afghan uh, Northern Alliance guys that were responsible for our outer cordon at Bagram. This is before HESCOs. Mm. There's no HESCOs. You got guys walking by, by your tent with an AK-47, and they are basically your outer and inner cordon security, the Northern Alliance guys. And they're like, hey, what's the big deal about knocking down a couple of buildings? Mm. And so I showed them a picture of Time Magazine with the towers. They had no idea mm. that that many people could be in a building or no idea that something that big could exist. Now this is before cell phones. Yeah. Uh, this yeah. Social media. Yeah. This is early on yeah. where they just, and they, Oh my, oh, oh, we get it because nothing can be built taller than a mosque in Afghanistan. Of course. So yeah. they're not used to anything like this. Yeah. 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 So l let's go a little bit into your time in Iraq. Cause I think that's what some of the, and we, we, we just so honestly, when we met uh, is in the context, cause I do a lot of work on Iran and Latin America. Right. Right. Um, Mike does a lot of work on Iran, yeah, in Iraq, but Iran just general uh, globally. And uh, so I hear about you from mutual friends that talk just glory about your time in Iraq, saying that you were one of the senior intel. You were like one of the guys that was really helping the U.S. intelligence community understand what's really happening, because there was a different narrative at the time, which is you know we want to believe in the transitional government, we want to believe right, in right. the new crap prime minister, and we want to like democracy is just on the horizon in Iraq. And what people were telling me was like, nah, it wasn't, it wasn't really what's happening. And you were one of the Intel guys that was there really close to that situation. So just take, how did you get there? You know, what was it like? Yeah, so, so I, my last uh, year in the military, I was a uh, embedded advisor with a Peshmerga battalion in Mosul. So coming out of the military, I've got a top secret clearance. I have recent Iraq experience. So I get hired uh, by, BA systems to be a, a subject matter expert on Iraq. And uh, when you first hear that term, you know, we want you to be a subject matter expert on Iraq. You, you, you're, you think to yourself, I'm not an expert on Iraq. <laughs> I'm not a subject matter expert on Iraq. I was just there. And then you realize that to them, that's all that matters. Yeah. That you're there. So I go into the Pentagon, I go into DIA, I start working in the Iraq intelligence group inside of, uh, down in the basement yeah. where the NMCC is now, the National Media, uh, National Military Command Center. And uh, I start seeing civilians for the first time working intel. And they're former military in some cases, but they seem to be cheerleading failure because they've, they've already politicized their assessments and I'm coming right out of the military. Mm. I believe in this stuff. I believe mm. we're supposed to win. We're supposed yeah. to do what we're supposed to do that Intel should. Yeah. You're should, trying to figure out how to win in Iraq. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So Intel should drive, you know, our, help yeah. our decision makers understand something, tell them what they need to know, not what they want to hear. And uh, I saw these analysts high-fiving each other after a, a failed operation by the U.S. where some soldiers, you know, got killed and the Iraqis, and, and I, I, I didn't but understand. high-fiving each other, it. why? Because they were right. They were, oh. they, they, Because they were happy they were right that they failed. And I saw this, and I I remember it, and I'm like, you guys, are you that disconnected from what's going on? Now, now granted, I'm out of Iraq less than 30 days. Yeah. You know, and... Uh, Did any of these guys go to theater? Were they, no, no. That's the, see, that's the thing, a lot of... Or a lot, like, someone will go to theater, and they just go to, you know, sit in, sit at a computer and never really get out and do anything. So we didn't really have uh, analysts with, with any military experience. experience yeah. And and they were actually the ones that were the, the worst, not not in a character way. Yeah. They weren't bad people, but they were, they prided themselves on not knowing anything about the military or the mm. Iraqi military or the U.S. military. And they simply read traffic. Mm. So they're that classic analyst in the intel community that decision makers do not want to hear from mm. when they ask them, so what is your assessment? Well, sir, 
can't really tell you what's going on. We haven't seen that in traffic yet. Mm. When an intel officer tells you they haven't seen that in traffic yet, it means that everything that they're getting is driven by what they're reading. Mm. And you and I both know that our enemies have figured out yeah. how to message us in and signals and they, intelligence and in humans. I mean, it's very common sense. Like if you know that the United States has this sophisticated capability of intercepting all kinds of signals, electronic and everything, you know that you're just going to talk a bunch of nonsense. Yeah, right? and, yeah. and, and then that nonsense is going to get caught up by some, some analyst somewhere. It's going to get translated. It's going to get interpreted. It's going to end up in a cable. It's going to end up in a report. And it's going to say, okay, this is what they're saying. So this yeah. is gospel. Right. It's like, but the guy the, the whole time who probably doesn't even have a cell phone, he knows exactly what he's doing. So that's what I used to lecture on. I used to lecture on Intel at National Defense University, basically saying, hey, listen, gone are the days where uh, an Al-Qaeda operator or somebody nefarious is going to say, the wedding package will be will arrive <laughs> tomorrow at this time at this location. They do, you know, roaming meetings. They talk, you know, they they know we're listening. Yeah. And what's interesting, if we just fast forward a little bit yep. uh, to uh, actually to my time as director of Veterans Against the Iran Deal, I remember talking to uh, Congressman Lou uh, from California. Yeah. And he, a Democrat, and uh, we thought we could change his mind on the Iran Deal. Mm -hmm. I remember going into his office, and he goes, "No, I've I've seen the intel." They're complying. And I said, okay, does it sound something like this? My name is so-and-so. I'm the director of Iran's nuclear program, and we're complying with UN Security Council resolutions and the JCPOA. Yeah. And he just looks at me. I said, sir, that's messaging. Yeah. That is not intel. That's, not intel. that's yeah. them taking advantage of a collection capability. The real collection platform is the one where you hear somebody say, don't ever call me at this number again. Yeah. And hang up. Yeah. That's the phone. The one that they pick up, and they basically use it as a PR yeah. vehicle, a public relations vehicle yeah. to basically right the wrongs yeah, yeah, yeah. of what's going on. Um, that's messaging. And one of the biggest things, I did a comparative analysis between human reports, meaning walk-ins. Mm -hmm. uh, the source you want is not one that walks in. No. The source you want is the one that doesn't want to talk to you. Yeah, and the one that you had to recruit. Yeah. That you had to go get. Yeah. You have to win over and get their trust. Um, I did a comparative analysis between our human reports and our signals intelligence reports in Iraq yeah. and compared it against two newspapers, one Sunni, <laughs> one Shia. Yeah. And if you put the Sunni paper and the Shia paper together, you could find the intel gaps, but they were more accurate than our SIGINT and human wow. reports because we were being messaged at that point. Yeah. Remember, uh, after June of 2009, we had the out of the cities uh, operation, the campaign where we moved out of the cities back onto FOMS and we went black. Mm. Our, our eyes there was a blackout, an intelligence blackout. Do you, do you think that's partially because U.S. intelligence tends to prefer SIGINT over human? Is yeah, that part of it? We're overly, overly reliant on advanced signals intercept to the point where our, our adversaries know that they can literally message us. And when a, when a congressman or a decision maker cites an intelligence report, and, and again, these, these SIGINT reports are classified at, at a high yeah. level. So the higher the classification and the more caveats, the more believable it is because you're, you're seeing something you're not supposed to see. So it must be true, right? But we lie all the time. And that was one of the things that I, that I talked about at National Defense University. And I said, um, you know, I lie on the phone all the time. Like, hey, honey, I'll, I'll, I'm going to be late tonight. I'm working. Yeah. Or, hey, I, I can't come in today because yeah, yeah. i got to take care of something. I'm sick. Yeah. But the yeah. National Security Agency, if you look at their their assessments of, of bad actors, they believe what they hear. If, if the other side doesn't know they're being listened to, yeah. which they do, yeah. they're telling the truth. They just assume they're being listened to. Like, even if they don't have a specific signal that they know about, they just know like the Americans have this capability. The Americans are really good at it. So anytime you're outside of the, the you know, in an environment where it's, and, and we, and they gotten very good at finding meets, you know, that are very hard to get signals into. Like right. I, I'll give you a small example, like in uh, the, Part of the world that I look at in Latin America and South America, what the Iranians were doing was taking ferries. Right. Because at a certain point in the, in the water, you're like, there's no signals, you know, right. you're just not getting anything. And then that's when they would have a meeting. Yeah, that's when the conversation that's takes when place. Conversation. Yeah. And then as soon as that comes, you know, they're back on their phones, they're back right. on this and they're messaging and saying whatever, understanding that all that's getting sucked up by our signals intelligence. Yeah. I mean, the, the best application, you know, is, is direction finding, being able mm -hmm. to find a, a specific location with somebody using their phone. Uh, one of the complaints that foreign fighters had in Afghanistan was they came there to kill Americans, but as soon as they opened their phone, they were droned. Mm. And so they never got a chance to see an American. And every time 
every time uh, they opened their phones, they were getting drones. So that's a great capability to make them that fearful of a phone. But it also sets them back. They stay off phones. They do those ro- roving meetings or yeah. roaming meetings. And, uh, you know, they just learn how to do things. So one of the things that, that you and I both know is that in order to find out what bad people are doing, you have to talk to bad people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, part of the uh, constraints on the U.S. intelligence community is we're no longer allowed to go out yeah, a lot of rules. and recruit yeah. those types of people. Yeah. You know, one of the biggest uh, failures in the ISIS campaign was our inability to develop a Sunni awakening like we did in Iraq during the surge because the guidelines under the Obama administration at the time was you can't work with anybody who used to be an insurgent. You can't work with anybody who used to be in one of these uh, Sunni jihadist groups. You can't work with anybody who has blood on their hands. Well, the only effective people in those areas have blood on their hands, have worked mm. with these groups before. And it, and part of the strategy to get a group to do something it doesn't want to do or people to do something they don't want to do is to, to gain their trust, empower them, mm. to take on the threat that only they can take on. Mm. So in order to defeat, defeat a Sunni insurgency, you need to do it with Sunnis. Mm-hmm. You can kill it with Shia militias, but you just, they, they think, every, back, they think yeah. everybody's a bad guy. Mm. You know, they think all the Sunnis are, are future terrorists or active terrorists. And the only way to go after an ISIS or an Al Qaeda is with Sunni, Sunni group, because you got to clear and hold territory. Mm. And this is the, the territorial campaigns, right? You can kill high value targets with anything. You know, it doesn't have to be a Sunni drone or a Shia drone. You can kill it. But in order to keep it from coming back, you need to counter it with Sunnis. Okay. And that's something that, that, the Biden administration and the Obama administration got away from because in order to secure the Iran deal, sorry about that. No, no, no. no. There was a, a insistence by Tehran that the U S not build a Sunni awakening group to take on ISIS, to not build a Sunni force. To take that was on one ISIS. of the conditions that Iran put. In Iraq and Syria and the Obama administration went with it. Mm. They were also the same administration that dismantled the sons of Iraq and Iran mm. uh, in Iraq. And that basically, if you put the sons of Iraq footprint on Iraq in 2008, you had security and you take it away. You got ISIS mm. because the sons of Iraq went after Al Qaeda. That's, that's interesting what you're saying. I, I like, like three questions from yeah, that. Yeah, I don't know how, which that. way to go, but um, well, let me just go. Let, so like, part, so Iran is manipulating the situation, right? They, they, they know what's happening in Iraq probably better than we do. Um, oh, it's, their, it's their area, but let, let me go. So you, you, you go to Iraq, right? And you spend, um, considerable amount of time with their uh, post-transitional government, which is the, I guess the first, uh, what they call Congress, uh, parliamentary elected government. Yep. Um, and and we, we just know what we know now with, you know, 2020 20 hindsight. Um, that was an Iranian influence, to put it mildly, government, right? How soon did you realize this? Well, the first time I actually got a look at this is, you know, I was an Iraqi security force analyst at the Defense Intelligence Agency. And we started seeing Sunni units become Shia units. Okay. Uh, majority Sunni units becoming my majority Shia units. And we started seeing this purge of effective, capable officers, whether they were Shia or Sunni, if they went after the militias and Al Qaeda, the government in Baghdad still got rid of them. Mm. They needed to only go after Sunnis. In order to to you know stay in stay in, so I briefed General Petraeus in 2006. He comes into DIA. I'm the I'm the guy that's going to brief him on the status of the Iraqi security forces. So Petraeus, before he becomes the multinational forces Iraq commander, uh, was the Minstiki commander, the multinational um, uh, force that was was stood up to train the Iraqi military. Okay. So when he's there, the two uh, divisions in Baghdad were 55% Shia, 45% Sunni. Mm. A year later, they're both at 95% Shia. Oh, wow. And I tell him this in 2006, and he can't believe it. Mm. And uh, this is where I cut my teeth. So I go to Iraq, and I give a brief on Iran's penetration of the Iraqi security forces and the Iraqi intelligence apparatus. How, how soon did that begin? Like day one, two thousand three. 03? When we rolled into Iraq, they rolled into Iraq. They unleashed 10,000 uh, IRGC Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, Quds Force trained Badr operatives. Mm. So you have 10,000 Badr operatives, and they were Iraqis 
who fought on the side of Iran during the Iran-Iraq war. Yeah. Uh -huh. So they get trained up. As soon as we go in, we basically ride them in because hmm. we're dealing with their political wean uh, called ISKI or SCARI, hmm. the uh, Supreme Council, Islamic Council of Iraq. And, uh, and we, we were working with their diplomatic wing because they speak English and they wear suits. Yeah. And then the militant wing, the border corps, is basically conducting an assassination campaign of any effective. Uh, uh, and does Maliki come from this? Yeah, Mal Maliki. Maliki. Because he was Maliki. 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 Yeah. Is it, he, 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 he leaves, right? Like during the. Uh, yeah, he's with the Dawa party. He leaves. He goes to Syria, is that right? Yeah, he yeah. goes to Syria. And, uh, you know, Dawa was the the closest group that was tied into the uh, Velayat al okay. you know, the, the spreading of the ideology yeah. that Tehran puts in place. So Maliki comes in as a compromise candidate. Again, we give Iran- And do we know this at the time? We, we know that he's, he's unknown. Yeah. He, 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 he is the compromise candidate, meaning Iran wanted somebody and we wanted somebody and we settled on this guy. We okay. wanted a, a Lawi. Yeah, okay. And Iran didn't want a law, so we, we all agreed on Mal Maliki, Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki. So Maliki takes over. We call him a compromise candidate. He becomes a, a strong man. He plays the U.S., and he plays, he plays the militias, and he basically starts uh, politicizing the Iraqi security forces. Is, he, is he the one This is 05, 06. Yeah. He, he starts it. Is he the one that's steering all this, what you then yeah. later found out was the, the, yeah. the purge of... So I give this brief about penetration. Petraeus yeah. hears it. I give it to Petraeus. Yeah. Uh, we have a back and forth. Yeah. Uh, Petraeus says, you know, I want a brief uh, where people push back. And he points at me, he goes, but not too much. <laughs> and I didn't get the chance to drop the 82nd Airborne Mafia yeah. H, <laughs> right, yeah. H minus tag oh. at the time. So I'm giving a brief as an, a DIA guy. And he can tell I'm a former military guy. And uh, H.R. McMaster is listening to this too. And Joel Rayburn, I mean, mm -hmm. bring me on their team. It's yeah. a small five-man team. And HR's job at the time is to find out the level of Iranian penetration in the Iraqi security forces. Mm -hmm. So I become their intel guy. Mm -hmm. And in that role, I get this uh, this advisory position inside of this, this nefarious organization stood up to basically be a shadow command and control uh, apparatus for what Tehran wants to do in Iraq. And it's called <laughs> the Office of the Commander-in-Chief. Is that what it's called? Yeah. So uh, it was the, uh, the OSINC was running battalion level ops. You become an advisor to that office? I, I'm basically an embed to, to, yeah, yeah, yeah. to, to get information. You're watching I, closely. You know, information. Yeah. And, and the first time I, I get in there is it's accidental. I'm in a t-shirt. I got a beard. Yeah. This guy comes up and says, hey, I got a meeting with uh, Dr. Bassema. Mm -hmm. And I hear you're the Dr. Bassema guy. So Dr. Bassema was uh, a female mm -hmm. who, whose father was a rocket scientist. <laughs> So he was working with Saddam's, you know, ballistic missile, you know, nascent program. And uh, she's basically running execution ops. She's running, she's basically getting battalions to make people disappear. So at this time, every morning you'll wake up to 56 dead Sunni just piled up on a, on a mm. city block. And we're averaging about 56 uh, attacks in Baghdad a day. Wow. Yeah. And, uh, and we're hearing from our from our teams that are embedded with the Iraqi military that, hey, these these Humvees are rolling out at night and we have no idea what they're doing. So they're rolling out and conducting their own ops. Like a assassination squad. Assassination squad. I remember meeting with this one one Iraqi who- and Is this Quds? Quds, Quds, Quds these are militia, this yeah. is Badr, Badr Corps and, and Jaysh al-Medi okay, yeah, and Jam yeah, yeah. at the time. This is before Kitab Hezbollah, before AH, yeah, yeah, before yeah, the yeah. other groups. This is where Qasem Soleimani is picking the talent. So- Talk to me about that because what yeah. I, I'm not obviously as, as you know, ingraining all the nuances of the Iraqi politics, but where does Soleimani come into the picture? Because people have told me that Maliki was always close to Soleimani going back even to the early days. Um, Soleimani is all that matters. It doesn't yeah. matter what Maliki's relationship is with Soleimani. Okay. All that matters is that people know who Soleimani is and, and Soleimani. And back then Soleimani was steering a lot of this. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. So Soleimani trained this force, yeah. you know, him and uh, Mugnia from Lebanese Hezbollah. Yeah. Uh, oh, he's still know, alive back then, right? Yeah, 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 he's still alive. He doesn't die until I think 2007, eight, eight, 2006, eight, 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 seven, eight, yeah, yeah, something like that. And uh, yeah, so Soleimani's back channeling the Bush administration and Petraeus and saying, you know, 
I make all the t- decisions in Iraq. I hope you know that. <laughs> and Petraeus is starting to tell uh, uh, Rumsfeld and Gates that, hey, uh, we're, our biggest threat in Iraq is from Iran, yeah. not from Al-Qaeda. They're responsible for the majority of the deaths in Iraq. This and is like 07, 08 is around that? Or yeah, 07 during the surge. Because yeah. the surge, we basically empower the Sunni yeah. uh, static security force. The yeah, Center of Iraq, the yeah. Awakening, yeah. and they just help us yeah. decimate yeah, Al-Qaeda yeah. leadership. And then they're protecting their neighborhoods against the Shia militias. Mm-hmm. And as soon as we start turning on the Shia militias, that's when we we start seeing, you know, you know, Karbala, mm. the Karbala 5. We start seeing... Uh, Increased use of EFPs, uh, rocket attacks on the international zone ahead of the uh, 2008 uh, election. Mm. You know? And so, w- at what point then do now you transition? Because you move from, you know, basically you're doing military intelligence analysis at the highest level uh, in a combat environment. Then you go to move to kind of like a more of an academic world, right? Well, I was brought into the academic world because mm-hmm. I was one of the few fellows that had street credit, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. that had been in the field yeah. because um, what my my think tank wanted to do was pair up somebody who had actually been out doing things with yeah. some of the academics, and then you'd get you'd get a a more comprehensive uh, package of of analysis, and that's always suited me. I've never been uh, afraid to uh, tell somebody what they need to know, yeah. not what they want to hear, or to uh, you know there was a unit that was getting ready to go to Iraq again to to take on ISIS, and they came to our our institute, the Hudson Institute. And they met with uh, myself and two other fellows, one guy from Brookings. And the one thing that resonates with me is they, they said afterwards, you go, this is the best briefing we got mm. because you guys disagreed with each other. Mm. You weren't all on the same page. You weren't putting out the same talking points. And, uh, you know, the reason they found me in particular was they asked, they say, hey, we're hearing the same thing from everybody. Is there anybody else who has a different take on this? Mm. And my name was mentioned by <laughs> DOD and state. <laughs> At the time, mm-hmm. during the Obama administration, and they were—I don't know—that's a good thing or a bad thing, but they're yeah. like, "Yeah, this guy has a different opinion." So he? he's got a different opinion, and uh, and they benefited from that because, again, I'm I'm not married to my assessments. I, I let facts move me, mm-hmm. but I w- it was very easy for me to see that a lot of the information being put out on ISIS initially was was cheerleading. Mm-hmm. You know, it's what it's what they got in trouble at CENTCOM yeah. under under General Austin for. And uh, I've been very critical of that. Yeah. So I want to go a little into Iran uh, sure. in the sense that um, one of the discussions now uh, here in D.C. and I think I guess in the world is uh, this Iran deal. So you you actually advocated against the Iran deal from right. day one. You actually, I, I, did you start the organization, the Veterans Against the Iran deal? Yes. So you started an organization basically recruiting military veterans to talk about why this is a bad idea. But actually when I was looking at it, I, you started it after the deal was signed? Um, right before, right before. So okay. we were trying to get a uh, a campaign uh, started to get victims of terrorism okay. to tell members of Congress and the Senate and Americans and especially their constituencies that the, the Iran deal was a bad deal. Yeah. And we didn't even focus on the nuclear aspect of the JCPOA. Okay, the Iran deal. We focused on the non nuclear concessions being made. Yeah, the questions like why is Qasem Soleimani getting sanctions relief? Yeah. Why is the Quds Force being delisted? Why are these terrorists that have nothing to do with Iran's nuclear portfolio? That's, that's a great point because I felt like like the Iranians wanted to create this narrative that this has to only be about technical nuclear conversations about how many isotopes and you know how many centrifuges. And stuff. But on the flip side, the, everything that they wanted was not nuclear related. They were like, we want the human rights sanctions relief. We wanted the uh, the delisting of the designations. We even wanted like prisoners to get released and stuff like that. Yeah. So, so the Obama administration at the time said, hey, listen, it's this deal or war. What a great campaign. It was, it was completely false. We're, yeah. we're at war with Iran now. Yeah. And this is what war looks like. We basically took out Qasem Soleimani. And I, I go back to 1988, Operation Cassandra. I'm sorry, Praying Mantis, mm. Ronald Reagan. Oh, is the naval? The, yeah, yeah, decimated yeah. half yeah. of Iran's Navy. Navy yeah. And they backed off. Because yeah. remember, they were mining yeah, I remember the that, yeah. of Hormuz, right? So we take out Qasem Soleimani January 2nd, 2020, mm. and Iran does nothing. <laughs> they blink. And that whole missile attack on the on on Balad, yeah, yeah, yeah. they use precision missiles. Did they hit, miss on purpose? To hit the non-American yeah, yeah. side of That's the That's what they look like. I was like, you trying not to but, hurt anybody? But, but still, a fa- failed leadership to keep the Americans there. We knew it was coming. So We kept you, the Americans there, and then they got concussed. What, what did that mean? So in all the concepts that we talked about, right, this, this is the kind of risk averse uh, culture, this group thing that's happening in the intelligence community. 
And then uh, there's a decision made at the highest levels at the, you know, the president, yeah. at the time President Trump, to uh, eliminate a, a threat, uh, but a, not just any threat, a basically someone that was considered untouchable by right. many administrations and many presidents because they just felt this guy was too powerful, he's too connected. And we talked about how much influence he had yep. with the transitional government in Iraq, the, the first uh, prime minister, the, and just like, what, what happens there? I mean, how does that decision get taken? How does it get reacted to by this community Many probably didn't want to make that decision. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, Mattis didn't want to do it. Yeah. Uh, he know, was gone by then, right? He, w he was yeah. gone by then, uh, but he was also gone because of those reasons. Yeah, he yeah. didn't want to do anything that would uh, hurt Iran's strategic uh, goals in the region because he thought it would derail the nuclear deal, mm -hmm. even though Trump had already got out of the nuclear yeah. deal. So that decision to take out Qasem Soleimani uh, came after uh, an American, Narwiz Hamid, was killed. Uh, in Iraq in a missile strike on December 28th. On the consulate? Or, or? December 27th. No, he's is on a base. Is okay. one of the bases dealing with ISIS. Okay. He was a uh, basically a facilitator between our U.S. special ops and the Iraqi mm -hmm. special ops to go after ISIS. And so Narwiz Hamid is killed by a Kitab Hezbollah missile barrage. Mm -hmm. And then they do the rehearsal. So when they seize the, they surround the embassy, when they storm the IZ and surround the embassy, that was a rehearsal because mm -hmm. they did it without weapons, but they went in to see how close they could get. And the chatter at the time was that Abu Mehdi al-Mohandas, the leader of Qatar Hezbollah, Hezbollah, and the de facto prime minister of Iraq, uh, worked close with Maliki. Maliki is not in power now, but Maliki and Hadi al -Amri. Do you remember him from back in your time in Iraq? Or was he there? Yeah, he was, but he was kind of an unknown guy at the time. Yeah. And he, uh, he boasted about being able to travel on U.S. military house, uh, uh. Uh, helicopters without anyone knowing who he was because he was a Council of Representatives uh, member. But... Um, that was a rehearsal. So the chatter was that Soleimani was going to seize the embassy, take hostages, and then do the whole thing that they do. Release hostages why, why, why for Why would Soleimani want to do that? Because it worked in 1979. But why now? Why Why at that time? Because of we walked away from the Iran deal. Sanctions okay. were crippling yeah, okay, okay, Iran's okay, okay. economy. Uh, we were tightening sanctions. We had just- It's almost uh, like desperation Yeah, the we, we, we made yeah. the IRGC a, a foreign terrorist foreign, yeah. organization. So they were feeling the heat, basically. They were feeling the heat. But at the same time, he wasn't worried about getting hit. This wasn't an intelligence yeah, yeah. operation. He His pattern of life was known to most people. Yeah, yeah. He felt very comfortable. Yeah, I always, I always talk about, because like they call it, I think it was the New York. The Shadow uh, New York, General. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, maybe back in like 2000, but like, and since Syria happened, he was out there taking selfies yeah, in the battlefield yeah. in Syria. So he yeah. went from the Shadow General to the Selfie General. Yeah, basically. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he gets he gets hit and everybody criticizes. It, we literally have politicized the killing of Qasem Soleimani because, uh, Politicians in D.C. didn't know who he was. That's, didn't know how effective great, he was. Not just in D.C. I felt like in the world. Yeah. They people had no like idea no was. idea. And I, I said something uh, in Spanish because I, you know, I do a lot of Spanish media. And I said, we just killed the bigger terror threat than Osama bin Laden. Right. Yeah. And everybody was like, what are you? And then they, they started calling me like crazy because they wanted to know, like, why was I saying that? I said, no, like, you, like OK, so Osama bin Laden was a major uh, terrorist. He was leader of the Al Qaeda, probably non-operational by the time we killed them. Um Qasem Soleimani was in the game. He was doing the thing. Yeah. And, and and frankly, he he's not just a terrorist. He's a terror trainer. He's a terror Terrorist sponsor. General. Yeah, terror yeah. general, you yeah. know. He would be like Osama bin Laden's financier, you know. In many ways, he probably was. He, and, exactly. He yeah. had he had the, the highest financed unit inside of the, the uh, mm -hmm. Islamic Revolutionary Guard. He was its most prominent member, or his most charismatic member. Mm -hmm. He had the allegiance of all these militias all over the Middle East. Um, he was more formidable than Osama bin Laden, more formidable than Baghdadi, mm -hmm. more formidable than, you know. And he was being groomed, I guess, politically, right? To, to Yeah, he was He was also had a lot of enemies because of that, yeah. because he started becoming more popular in some circles than the, the Supreme Leader. And, you know. Oh, yeah. Him. And, uh, you know. So was he making that move? Was he trying to? No, make, no, 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 no. He was, he, I think he was a, a loyal. An operational commander. Person, yeah. But the other. The other uh, generals didn't like that he was, you know, if you were the commander of the IRGC, you were still in Soleimani's shadow, even though he was a member inside of the unit with his yeah. Um But taking taking him out, and I remember that. I'm like, you don't know who, who Qasem Soleimani is. Uh, you know, do you Where have, were you when that happened? Were you, were you uh, in D.C.? or I had been criticized for the two years prior to the strike for, People would say to me. For just suggesting we should hey, do that. <laughs> all you do is talk about Qasem Soleimani uh -huh. and Abu Mehdi al And I said, I do. Because every time you talk about Iraq, you leave them out. And they're making all the decisions. They're the ones that have basically built up this 
militia, the Hashid al-Shabi, mm. to counter the Iraqi security forces. It is their revolutionary guard inside of Iraq. And uh, I published two op-eds that morning. They got, they got published that morning calling for Mohandas and Soleimani to be targeted. Before, before six was, hours later, they were both killed. Oh my gosh! I mean, I knew it was. Did you know happen. that was happening, or? Well, I said it on a news program. I said, yeah. you know, these are two, Qasem Soleimani and Mohandas are well, le- you knew legitimate that military targets. They did the rehearsal targets. against the embassy. Yeah, and, yeah, I, said, yeah. I said they're legitimate military targets. It was after they they killed Narwaz Hamid, the yeah. American yeah. Uh, translator, and the uh, they seized the embassy. I said these are two legitimate military yeah. targets. And yeah, they're on the battlefield. And yeah. they asked you, 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 you seriously saying that we should take out Qasem Soleimani? I go, yes, he's the general in charge of a foreign terrorist organization. He's a foreign terrorist organization. Uh, and he's a, rank, he's a ranked military commander. And we'd have no problem if he was a leader of ISIS or a leader of yeah. Al-Qaeda, but why do we have a problem if he's a leader of a Shia uh, terrorist group? And uh, that morning I published in the Jerusalem Post and the uh, al Arabiya online. Yeah. And I, I just knew I was getting asked questions from people inside the government. Hey, who are the top five people that, that, if they were if no longer there would, would change things. Mm. And unfortunately they didn't get the other three people. <laughs> and, you know, Case Kazali was one of the names. So how, how much, did, how much did that changed the game? Uh, it changed the game until March 27th when okay. they killed an American and a British soldier and we didn't do anything about it. Okay. So for and by two that time, months, COVID, were, COVID hit, right? So three yeah. months they were terrified. And then they killed an American and a British soldier, I think March 27th, the Balad or Taji mm. Air Base in a rocket attack. And we had no response. And at that point, they knew that, okay, Americans are distracted. Yeah, yeah. Now there's been degradation in the IRGC's capability, uh, the IRGC Quds Force's capability with this Malakani. He's not Qasem he's not Soleimani. Same, yeah. uh, he's in his shadow. Mm. He's not. He was his lieutenant, right before all this. Uh, uh, he was in charge of Afghanistan portfolio. Yeah. So he was, you know, going back. You know, you know, I testify now in in U.S. District Court on the behalf of victims of terrorism, mm-hmm. and you know, I. I'll talk to judges who ask me questions like, so you saying Iran worked with Al Qaeda to kill Americans? Yes. I'm surprised that's still kind of like not known. Uh, I mean, that's, it's, it's, not, it's like beyond the intel world. I mean, that's yeah. well known. Journalists but, know it. I it mean. goes back to 93. The Osama bin Laden documents that were declassified shows show yeah. it. And now they even talk about it. The next leader of, of, of Al Qaeda is likely one of these senior leaders uh, that have and they're like living in safe Iran. haven in yeah. Iran. Yeah. Exactly. And, um, I, I don't know why we, we have this issue with with thinking that somehow, you know, ever since Obama embraced the Islamic Revo- uh, the Islamic uh, Republic of Iran, his party is afraid to criticize him for it. Yeah, it used to be a, a nonpartisan yeah, issue. Was, Iran, Iran, Iran was. Yeah. Know, they, they took our embassy in '79, and pretty much we looked at them yeah, as yeah. as a problem ever since. And then, really, I remember that. And then, you know, post when the conversation when that you know infamous Ben Rhodes echo chamber started yeah. to take shape. He pretty much polarized uh, politicians in society. Yeah. People were just like, if you're on them, you have to be a uh, pro Iran, pro Iran deal. If you're on the right, then you're against it. And because you're against it, you're against peace or you're against uh, trying to, when's the, when the sunset clauses start taking place? Or like now? Well, 2003. Yeah. Ballistic missiles. Yeah. 2004. Center for 24. 24. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. 2024. 2023. Ballistic missiles, 2024, uh, advanced uranium, yeah. uh, centrifuges, and then it completely expires in 2030. Yeah. And the the Biden administration has done nothing to strengthen the Iran deal. So this isn't a partisan issue. This is, I'm, this, I'm warning about it. Yeah. People that are against the Iran deal are warning that it doesn't keep them from a nuclear weapon. It actually facilitates And they've been lying the, the whole path. way. I mean, they've been they, cheating every step of the way. So if these... We're two groupings of nuclear sites. Mm. This is in the JCPOA. This one's not. Mm. So they're only talking about declared sites. So you hear language. As soon as you hear language from a politician in D.C. about, well, we have we have uh, intel assets looking at their declared sites. I'm like, well, what about their undeclared sites? <laughs> you know, Russia helped us uh, uh, capture or, or control, safeguard uh, Assad's chemical mm. stockpile of declared chemical weapons and declared stockpiles. What about the undeclared ones? Yeah. You know, and that's, that's how our enemies operate. It's, yeah. it's consensus. I was talking to uh, one of your assistants earlier about conflict resolution, right? Mm-hmm. So this is how it, it works. This is, this is the consensus. This is the, uh, you know, making exceptions saying, okay, in order to get a deal, 
we'll agree not to look at these sites. We'll only look at these sites. And we still can't look at these sites. I, I, would, we, I would characterize it, you know, especially for our, you know, our Latin American audience, kind of like you know, they know a lot about drugs, drug trafficking. Right. Like is the equivalent of the cops, basically you telling the cops that they can search your home, but they could only search at a certain time and they can't go in the bathroom. Right, right. Exactly. That's exactly and, what it is. And, and I was like, you know, okay, no, no one's going to, that's not a real inspection. That's you, not a real. You got to let us know when you're coming. Yeah. We get two weeks to prepare for your visit. And you can't look at that. You, know? you can't look at that. And we're not going to, and one of the problems the IEA has uh, with this is that they've actually detected uranium deposits in places that they shouldn't be in and, uh, and, and uranium metal. Mm. And Iran says, well, that's old. That was from before the JCPOA. And, and you know, it's, it's easy because most Americans, and it's, you have to deal with this frustra frustration also, don't understand that the, the Iran deal they don't understand it at all, first off. Yeah. But it does not keep Iran from a nuclear weapon. It, yeah, yeah. It's basically an economic incentives program disguised as a really bad arms deal. In many ways, it kind of funds their, pro, their nuclear program. It does. Yeah. And, and going back to that, that point uh, where we focus on the non-nuclear concessions, the Obama administration would say it's either this or war. And they said that the Iran deal was not meant to curb their activity in the Middle East. The Iran deal was not meant to stop their ballistic missile program. But- those things were delisted. So the banks used to fuel terrorism were delisted. The individuals that con uh, conducted arms shipments to Lebanese Hezbollah, Hamas, and other groups uh, were delisted. So the Annex 2 of the JCPOA fuels terrorism, fuels mm -hmm. their ballistic missile program, fuels their illicit arms trafficking. And so your translation of the Iran deal is that it has nothing to do with it. The only translation or the only... Uh, you know, version of the Iran deal that matters is the one the Iranians believe mm. is in place. And they will say to this day, all sanctions were removed from Qasem Soleimani. And the administration would say, no, just nuclear sanctions. Well, there were no nuclear sanctions oh, on Qasem yeah. Soleimani. So, yeah. so Iran basically says that we've been in violation of it. And there was another clause where we were supposed to promote investment inside of Iran. And we didn't because of the IRGC's penetration of every economic sector inside of Iran every economic sector inside of Iraq and every economic sector inside of Syria, Lebanon, Lebanon and Yemen, and I'm sure Venezuela. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah. So, you know, it's, it's how do you get people to care and Americans can care. And when you and I have met with politicians, we, we, we can see the deer in the headlights stare sometimes. And it's usually their chief of staffs that we'll meet with. And they'll say things like, well, it's complicated and complex. And we've seen the Intel and we're comfortable no, you've been messaged. It's you're not going to do anything about it, and our adversaries are going to continue to take advantage of this. So what I what I've noticed is um, actually this was this was explained to me by by somebody that was um, in the U.S. government, um, actually in the State Department during the uh, first when they're negotiating the Iran deal in like 2014 before the, the deal was signed. And the way they described it in terms of, you know, big picture geopolitics and strategic vision, they were saying Obama wanted to pull out the Middle East, right? He wanted to get out of the wars. He wanted to get all that stuff. He wanted to pivot to Asia, right? But his thinking or the thinking of the administration then was that they had to leave something in charge, right? And that would be Iran, right? They, they didn't trust Israel. They didn't want Israel to be, and they didn't think the Arab, Israel, basically what we now know what would hurt, which is Arab-Israeli uh, uh, cooperation, uh, they didn't believe in that. They thought, I mean, I think it was John Kerry who's, and he said that won't ever happen, that, you know, it's impossible. And so they wanted to give it to Iran. And so they wanted to give Iran the incentives to basically have responsible leadership over the Middle East, right? And my pushback to then, back then, was that, well, what precedent is there to su suggest that Iran will, has ever done responsible leadership? They don't do it in another country. They didn't do it in Iraq. And they're not doing it anywhere. And the resulting impact of that was civil conflicts everywhere else in the Middle East, right? That's Syria and Yemen and now Lebanon. And um, what I failed to really get is why we kind of have this insistence on basically thinking that Iran's like the good guy in the Middle East. Like we still want to kind of believe that because, you know, we, you know, 9-11 with Al-Qaeda was the Sunni Salafist terror movement that, that moved that. So what is it? And I feel like at some point, maybe the intelligence is so skewed. Uh, it's, and I'll give you an example. Like in the part of the world that I look at, you know, our military uh, Southern Command at one point, had I think like a five to one, maybe more, like five or six to one ratio. They had like six uh, Sunni extremist analysts for every one Shia, right? And and you go Latin America, I mean, it's Hezbollah, right? right That's who's right, running right, the show right, right. there. And you might have like an ISIS foreign fighter, and Malqueda might have like a small shop somewhere in Sao Paulo, but 
it, you know, it's not even comparable. But why, why is that? Why, why do you think that's still the case? I think it's as simple as this, and it's very naive. Yeah. Um, we were in the Middle East. The Obama administration believes we were in the Middle East because of Sunni extremism. True, 9-11, um, Al-Qaeda. And who better to take on a Sunni threat than Shia. Iran? Yeah. And so it's, it was that simple. That's very, very simple, yeah. it, was, it was almost like Costanza and Seinfeld. Let's do the opposite yeah. of what Bush was doing. And um, it doesn't make sense. And as you say, you know, let's focus on Asia. No, if you're focusing on China, you focus on it Iran. everywhere. Yeah. As we tilt out of the Middle East, Russia and China entrench. As we focus on Southeast Asia, uh, China's focusing on the Southern Hemisphere. Yeah. They're already here. Yeah. And you cannot deal with China geographically, meaning thinking that they're only yeah. operating this one geographical area of operation. Or Iran for that They're matter. everywhere. Yeah. And Iran's doing the same thing. And now we have an alliance between Russia, China, Iran. And, and Iran. And we're seeing each each of those countries can suppress uh, we, human rights in their countries. Why, why was also this resistance yeah. to put to not have Iran part of the GPC conversation, right? Because it was always Russia, China, Russia, China. Don't consider Iran a great power. I was like, you could make an argument that Russia's not a great power either, right? Like if you right. want to use on metrics of economics or military strength, and that's getting proven right now in the Ukraine war. But it was I always felt, I always felt like you really got to talk about the three because that's real. That's a, that's a, that's a real alliance. That they're I mean yeah. they have differences. They're historical adversaries. We get all that, but they've figured out a way to work together. And I always thought it was just really with the only common objective of defeating the United States. I mean, once that happens, it hopefully it doesn't. But if it ever does. They'll turn on each other. I'm almost positive of that. They'll end up fighting each other. But yeah. for the meantime, uh, yeah, it's not an equal partnership. Yeah. Uh, Russia and China are, are predatory uh, lenders. Yeah. Uh, China's a predatory lender. Everything that China's building inside of Iran is for China. Yeah. Uh, Russia and China both want the Iran deal passed so that Iran can be able to buy advanced weapons yeah. and, and military have these military contracts fulfilled. Uh, and even hardliners will say, hey, we got to stop trusting the Russians and the Chinese are taking advantage of us. Russia's taken water rights. Russia has taken oil and gas uh, guarantees from not only Iran, but northern Syria. And China's financing everything. So when you look at one of the ways to get at the hardliners to say, you know, the Chinese are just taking advantage of you. Uh, you're, you're not equal, you know. And one of the things that you can actually look at is how desperate Russia is that they needed Iranian drones in the Ukraine. Yeah. And they're not accurate and the Ukrainians are able to shoot them down because it, it works in Iraq when you have nothing to shoot them down. Mm. It doesn't work in Ukraine when they can take them out. Mm. And it shows how desperate Russia is to actually rely on Iran's uh, drone capability. But let's talk about how weak uh, Russia and Iran are. I mean, China, again, a $21 trillion economy, the U.S., a $20 trillion economy, Iran, less than $400 billion, mm. heavily uh, crippled by U.S. sanctions alone. Uh, Russia, 1.9 trillion. But each one of these countries, like you said, don't care about a press. They don't have a opposition party. Yeah. Uh, they basically can shut down population centers. And they, what, don't, they don't really care about governing. So they're not, they're not really worried about providing no, no, for their people or, you know. No, it, it's nothing like that. And now you see an issue like, um, you know, Amini getting killed for not wearing the hijab or not wearing yeah. it correctly inside of Iran. And, uh, and the uprising. So that's how weak this regime is. It can collapse. But because we're so risk averse about changing out people we know, such as Gaddafi or Saddam Hussein, or, you know, having this regime change policy, we're so worried about what comes next in Iran. And I don't think that's a reason to give this regime a lifeline. They're, Has the Biden administration said anything about about the recent protests, or are they? Yeah, they they said that they're trying to give them internet, uh, Starlink, things oh, like yeah. that. You know, but you, in order to get Starlink in the country, you have to get Starlink in the country. Yeah. Uh, but there's other ways we can give them internet. You know, our neighboring countries, our neighbor, neighboring places where we have influence, uh, Iraq. You know, we can. Now, be, is this, this going to be kind of green revolution size? Uh, well, this is protests? this is bigger than that because yeah. that was a political thing yeah. that wasn't. In the election yeah. supported by the whole country. This is a a uh, Iran's trying to call it a Kurdish issue because she was Kurdish, but it is an Iran issue. It is an issue, and that's how weak this regime is. That a hijab could derail this regime. So if they just said all of a sudden that the hijab is no longer mandatory, the regime would collapse. Yeah, that's how weak it is, and it, it, it's weaker still for. 
you know, torturing and killing a woman for not wearing it correctly. And you see these pictures of Qasem Soleimani being torn down and burnt. You see the pictures of the Supreme Leader. And they're saying no to the dictator, death to the dictator. And they're talking about the Supreme Leader inside of Iran. And we're getting to see that. So whoever's getting that internet out, you know, it's the Israelis, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. other people, uh, keep keep doing it. But the, but the challenge now, and it seems like, you know, I don't know if it's bad timing, or it seems like this happens when really there's no external support, right? That, that, I mean, that was the Green Revolution, right? It happened at the worst yeah, time yeah. for the Iranians, you know? Yeah. There was no one that was going to, because uh, as different from Ukraine, who has all the external support from the Europeans, from the Americans, from pretty much the world, even the Turkish are helping them. But in uh, Iran, is there anyone going to give external support to the Iranian protesters? Or, you know, I don't think the, is the Biden administration that don't, doesn't look like it. We, we, don't, we don't need to. Sometimes we'll, we'll just mess it up. We yeah. don't we do not do regime. We, we're not very good at regime yeah. change. If we get behind it, uh, then it would look like uh, you can say, oh, it's a CIA yeah, field yeah. thing. You got to let it be organic like it is. But the one thing the U.S. can do is put a, put a spotlight on it. We think it's better to get an op-ed published in the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, and New York Times than it is to get it in some local paper in some politician's district, which would actually have more of an effect mm. because, or have an ad in that area to target that politician. Because you know, I mean, there's there's a lot of people that are that make money by facilitating a meeting with a politician. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And they think, now that I've gotten in front of this politician that should care about this issue, now things are going to change. And you and I know that doesn't happen. So actually, that's a good, good, good point, and it's gonna be like the the last part we talk about because it's you know we're both in the think tank world. I mean, you're at the Hudson Institute, yeah. I mean, I'm here at SFS, and um, it kind of why we're doing this podcast to be honest with you because, and I I got this data point maybe like two years ago during the pandemic. In the beginning, you know, the pandemic forced everyone to just like figure yeah. have to adapt because you know think tanks without events. <laughs> what is that? You know, like we're like exactly. And, I, and the webinar thing, I never jumped on that because I I, there was, I wanted to kill myself after like two or three webinars, right? Because I mean, I get their purpose, but they're not an event. Uh, they, you know, people don't go to events just for information. They go to meet people. They go to network. They go they, for many other reasons for for marketing. Um, a webinar is really just an informational briefing, and you keep it short. Maybe it's fine, but these long webinars, I didn't like. But the data point that they uh, showed me was um, how much percentage of the U.S. audience, uh, what they call internet users, which is between the ages of sixteen and sixty four consume their information. And what I found out was 93%, 93% of internet users between the age of 16 and 64 here in the United States consume their information and use through video. Yes. Yeah. You're basically preaching to the choir. Yeah. I mean, I've had panels where I intentionally have people on panels that disagree with me because I like to argue, yeah. you know, when, when the argument or learn something and uh, you know, Jordan Peterson said, you know, if you got to, if you're going to read a book, you got to sit there and read it. If you're going to write, uh, something you got to sit there and write it. A podcast, a, a an audio uh, podcast or a video podcast is something you could take with you on the run. You yeah. can listen to it. You don't have to watch it, but you can listen to it. And it's unfiltered and, from any respect. Yeah, it's, it's, it's it's an honest conversation that's not rehearsed, not planned, not cut out. I think it is. It. Let me let me let's wrap up this way. So uh, you said you got a book coming out. Uh, is it yeah. coming out soon, or is it? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm in a, a, a redraft. I'm. I'm putting some stuff together. What, what I'm trying to do, like most people that write books, is my first book, right? Yeah. Is I, I walk through a bookstore and I'll see these books on these, these issues. And this is your first? This is my first book. Really? First book, yeah. Like you've written, well, you've no, written a lot written, of papers. Yeah, yeah, op-eds, things like that. But this is my first book. And, uh, you know, I'll go to a bookstore and I'll see somebody famous who wrote a book and it's discounted. That discount part doesn't bother me. It's the fact that it was a snapshot in time that is no longer relevant that bothers okay. me. So I'm trying to make sure that what I write has legs yeah. and it's not for the DC audience. It's not for my peers. It's not group think or think tank. Well, who's it for? It's for moms and dads whose sons and daughters uh, have gone to war. Okay. have been in these forever wars. Mm -hmm. It's basically talks about how bad decisions have been made. Cause I've had the, the unfortunate position of being in the room when bad decisions were being made without a vote, yeah. without, without the credentials to say no. So I've, I've sat in rooms, I've, I've listened to the experts speak, and I've heard them say things that I know aren't true, but I didn't have a, a way to counter that without getting fired and thrown out of the room, right? Yeah. So the book's about, you know, how forever wars happen, why they happen, and it goes, in, it goes into that, uh, falls into those three categories of people. The Cassandras warn about it, the cheerleaders say everything's going great, 
you know, the cheerleader keeps us in forever wars. Yeah. The cautious believes the cheerleader, knowing that Cassandra's right, keeps us in forever wars because, you know, they don't want to make those difficult positions. Mm. You know, if you make a difficult dis- decision that ends up getting Americans killed, the best way to avoid that is to kick the can down the road. Yeah. And that just keeps us in these 20 year complex. Again, we're there 20 times for one year at a time and Iraq and Afghanistan and both, both have been failures. Yeah. And, uh, to Iraq, in my opinion is for us to disfavor Baghdad sanction target, uh, it's economic sectors because Iran is using Iraq as a lifeline. And, uh, it, I'm worried that Iran's going to make their move on Baghdad. Actually. Well, they're they're already there. Yeah, no I mean, they're reason, already there, but like they already own it. There's no reason to roll across the border. They, they already own. They it. want us to you know, have an Afghanistan moment, probably, I'm sure. Uh, they're already there. Yeah, you've written a lot of papers, a lot of op eds. We, we we see you. You could see Mike. He's a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute. You could see it on the Hudson Institute website, but you could also see him basically on on your cable news networks. But um, what we'll do is we'll put a link. As soon as you have an Amazon link, yep. even if it's you know forthcoming, oh, I appreciate that. We'll put the Amazon link uh, on our uh, YouTube page. Uh, we'll also put it down in in the notes. Uh, and be sure that you have social media. You're pretty active on Twitter. Uh, yeah, I, I kind of stepped away a little bit because uh, I want. I like your Twitter account. Yeah, no, it, it's it's uh, it's kind of like a little bit sarcastic. It's but. kind of an Intel feed, but <laughs> it's um uh, at m p p. So at M P Pregents. At M P Pregents. So P is my middle name, Philip. So okay. M P Pregents. At, at M P Pregents, you can follow follow Mike. Mike, it's good to have you. Hey, we didn't even me. talk about the border. We got to get that next no, time. No, not from El Paso, Texas. Yeah, I know. Yeah. You're from Texas, so you know you know you know how bad that 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 can get. Um, if you're new to our channel, be sure to you hit the subscribe button, be sure to like the video, be sure to share the video that helps with the algorithm. Um, you know, we're going to have more conversations like this. Uh, we'll probably have Mike, we, we, you, and now that I know that you live in this town, I always thought you lived in Texas, but now that I know you lived in, uh, the Northern Virginia area, you see beautiful Northern Virginia right here. Uh, we'll definitely have you back. Absolutely. We have had a few, uh, other, other guests that come on the podcast that were, you know, mostly Iraq veterans. We had some Afghanistan as well, but mostly Iraq veterans. So right. definitely want to uh, come back and uh, be sure to like, subscribe uh, on the video, sharing platforms, and we'll see you next time. Subscribe to the Border Wars podcast and visit our website at securefreesociety.org. See you in the next episode.